Language is very important in framing. We don't call it the West Bank. We call it Judea and Samaria because it's ours, right? Why does the world begrudge us Judea and Samaria? We've already made a major concession to the Arab world. We get, when we gave up claim to Jordan, we gave up claim to the entire eastern part of the land of Israel. All we want is the eastern part. Is that too much to ask? <laughs> you see, so it might sound kind of arcane, and, but this is really a part of the Israeli concept and Israeli policy. So we're after the land of Israel, which is not, not a, 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 a contained by the state. The state is, is on the way to the land of Israel, which today would include the entire country between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. So the idea is that the land of Israel belongs exclusively to the Jewish people. And this is the fly in the ointment that ruined everything. I don't believe the conflict was inevitable. I really think that had the Zionists come to Palestine a hundred years ago, eighty years ago, and it said, we see this as our homeland. We want to revive the Jewish nation, a Hebrew nation. We want to speak Hebrew. We want to come back. We want a Hebrew university, Hebrew literature. We're being persecuted. We also need a place of refuge. But, but, we acknowledge and recognize that there is a Palestinian people living in this country. And I'm not just projecting back. There were voices like this a hundred years ago. Had that been said, I believe those two national movements could have reconciled. I don't think the con it wouldn't have been easy. By national states, I don't know if it would have been a state. I don't know what would have come out of it. But that acknowledgement I think would have allowed the two peoples, because there wasn't an enmity in the beginning, would have allowed the two peoples to find us a way to live together. But coming out of Eastern and Central Europe, they had this idea until today of exclusivity. This is our country. There is no other people here. Uh, there is no other people that have a claim to our country and therefore we're in a historical process that is morally justified in the Zionist point of view of reclaiming our ancient, our ancient homeland. So the, the, and the flip side of this is this, that Arabs, now I say Arabs on purpose. We don't use the word Palestinian in Israel. Because to say Palestinian gives too much recognition, distinctiveness, legitimacy to another people, another collectivity with, with claims to our country, with claims to self-determination that we, we don't want to recognize. I mean, it would be counterproductive to say this is exclusively our country, but there's a Palestinian people here. You'd be undercutting your own exclusive claim. So we talk about Arabs in a very undifferentiated way. Arabs. So the idea is that the Arabs reside in our country by sufferance and not by right. In other words, we see there's a lot of Arabs around. I mean, we're not blind, there's Arabs around. But they don't add up to a collectivity with rights of self-determination. And that's what, that's what made the Zionist movement colonial. Once it came into somebody else's country and denied the, the indigenous people's existence, very existence, and their right to self-determination, that's what made Zionism a colonial movement. That's, from my point of view, the tragedy of Zionism. Because it didn't have to happen. I don't think Zionism had to become a colonial movement. And, uh, and I think part of our job as Israelis is to decolonize Zionism in order that we can really find, it's a hundred years too late, 
the way to, to live with Palestinians in, in uh, inequality. But this is the idea that then undermines, um, because otherwise it's hard to explain why Israel rejected the two-state solution. You know, more than 20 years ago, in 1988, the PLO rec accepted the two-state solution and, es and essentially gave up political claim to 78% of historic Palestine by doing that, which is a generous offer, probably too generous, that has never been acknowledged, you know, never really been very much even talked about, which is a part of the reframing. And the Palestinians said, if we can get a state on the 22% of our historic homeland, a, 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 a state, a Palestinian state, we will make peace with Israel. And Israel, Israel rejected that more than 20 years ago, before Oslo. So the question is, if Israel really wants peace and security, if that's really what it's telling us, what it's all about, why didn't it grab the two-state solution 20-some years ago? You could have had peace and security for 20 years and 78% of the country. And it doesn't make any sense. Building of settlements, I mean, pushing this to a point where, where a, a one-state solution becomes the only option, which is the negation of anything Zionist, in a sense, doesn't make sense unless you understand this principle of exclusivity, that we're claiming the entire country. The other piece that's very important is, you know what, this is all true. But nevertheless, you know, ideology weakens over time. And a new generation of Israelis doesn't really call itself Zionist. My kids, I mean, if you say Zionist, it's a weird thing to say. Um, in Israel, you know how the kids use the word Zionist? If you say to them, uh, be home by 10 o'clock, mind your manners, and don't eat too much chocolate, they'll say to you, don't talk Zionism to me. <laughs> Zionism, you know, as generations go, I mean, you know, you're all Americans. If I would ask you, are you Hamiltonian Democrats or Jeffersonian Democrats, who knows what that means? 200 years ago, that was a very important question. So what I'm saying is, as, as the Zionist ideology recedes, uh, a lot of Israeli Jews are willing to accept the two-state solution. 85% of the Israeli Jewish community uh, uh, accepted the Oslo peace process. So you have to have another element to reinforce this because this, uh, this claim of exclusivity gets a little bit hard to, to continue to justify if in fact most Israelis want peace. And therefore as an additional kind of an element to, to reinforce it all, the idea that Israelis have been inculcated with, Israeli Jews, since before 1948 even, is this, that the Arabs are our permanent enemies. There can never be peace. And you know the famous phrase of Ehud Barak, there is no partner for peace. And this is the Labour Party. I mean, this isn't Sharon and Begin and Netanyahu. This is the Labour Party, who is, and, and Barak was the most decorated soldier in the history of the Israeli army. Whoa, a guy like that, who t with all that authority, that tells me there's no partner for peace. The Arabs are our permanent enemies. There can never be peace. Whoa, I kind of, that, that has, that, that re you know, it's more than some politician getting up. This is a general with all of that authority telling me that. And that's what Israelis have really, I think, have really accepted. That's become a kind of an assumption in life. And that's what's neutralized them. So if you take these two things together, then the whole thing boils down to security. We have to have security, and we have to permanently control the land of Israel. 
And therefore, politically speaking, what Israel is trying to do, the bottom line, literally, is then the task before us, you know, before us, in other words, the Israeli government, is to transform a temporary occupation. Because occupation is defined in international law as a temporary military situation to transform that into a permanent state of control. So that's really where this... Now, you can't say this in public. That's the problem. Because the minute you start talking about this, you're going to get accused of... How do you know? You'll be accused of it. But, and so the whole foundations of Israeli policy and the conception of Israel is kind of outside the realm of, um, of, of, of speaking. And therefore, when this is what pro-Israeli speakers will bring into the room, but they're not going to say it. So we have to then reframe. Uh, we have to reframe the, the, the... We have to reframe then, and I'll do it really quickly. Now we're coming to the part of the framing that is articulated. So this is the first part of the framing. Kind of coming out of what we just said, Israel says that we're a small Western democracy merely defending ourselves against Arab Muslim terrorism. Boom, that's it. Now, in addition to that, I mean, what's implied or what's said, if I, if I, if I go on to elaborate, is that Israel is the victim, right? Now, that dove dovetails very strongly with the image of Jews in general. I mean, Jews are the ultimate victims. Um, and uh, one of the problems that I sometimes have with Palestinian speakers is often, you know, they do a litany of suffering. You know, when this happened at this checkpoint and demolitions, it's all terrible, but you're not going to out-victim the Jews. <laughs> We've cornered that market. <laughs> so you've got to find, you know, I, you know, you've got to find another, another form of framing. Because to be a victim is a very powerful place to be. If you're the victim, you can't be held responsible for anything. You can't be held accountable because you're the victim. And you see this with the Goldstone Report. The Israeli outrage and the whole thrust of Israeli uh, uh, diplomatic activity against Goldstone is, wait a minute, how are you equating the terrorists with us? The good victims, the Jews, so here's anti-Semitism gets into the pot, you know, so that if you can be a state, you know, the Palestinians don't have a state. Israel's a state with a tremendously powerful army. You know, Israel is the fourth largest nuclear power in the world. It has never signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, does not allow international inspection, and it's the occupying power. The Palestinians are occupying Tel Aviv. You combine all that power with being the victim. And the, and the oppressed become the perpetrators. You turn everything on its head. That shows you how powerful framing is. In 2006, when the international community, led by the United States, at the urging of Israel, imposed the siege on Gaza, after the Hamas uh, election victory, John Dugart, who was at that time the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the Palestinian Areas, wrote that this is the first time in history that the oppressed people have been sanctioned. I mean, the oppressed were besieged. And the oppressor was the one that received all the international sympathy and the international support. So it shows that this framing issue is not just some cute academic exercise, that it really does shape the way you see things.